Okay, we're back. We're live. Uh, here it is on a given Monday at uh, noon with uh, Marco and me talking about energy in Hawaii. Welcome back to the show, Marco. It's always good to have you on. Another enchanted Monday with my dear friend Jay Fidel. Thank you, Jay. All Great right, to be well, back with you. Now that we got that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> So well, it's funny to talk about. Let's let's talk, you know, at least to some extent, about the Maui Energy Conference, which which filled up last week, and uh, I, I wasn't there, and you weren't there for that matter. But uh, there were a lot of people there, and they were networking up a storm. Um, but uh, you know, uh, what what is, what is the Maui Energy Conference anyway? It's put on by MEDB in Maui, and what is it intended to achieve? I think it's just uh, Maui's annual effort to bring together some of the energy stakeholders, a number of the energy stakeholders uh, across from the state, across the state, and they, uh, they network and they hobnob and they meet in the foyer and they have meals afterwards and they attend uh, panel discussions. Typically, Hawaiian Electric has a pretty strong showing there. I know Alan Oshima was there, president of HECO, uh, and chairman uh, or president of HEI, Connie Lau, was there. I saw the pictures. Uh, that Henry Curtis was trying to show on his blog. And I think it just kind of looks at the various topics du jour uh, from the energy perspective and kind of gives a chance for people to uh, to take the temperature of what's, what's hot and what's not. I know there was some discussion over the possibility of uh, nuclear energy in Hawaii. I think that was more kind of an attempt to generate some, some heat. Uh, no, no pun, pun intended. intended. Yeah. But uh, I mean, n nuclear in this state, I think, is not only is it a you know against uh, there's a part in the Hawaii state constitution that thou shalt not go nuclear, but I mean just the practicalities of of nuclear in our state uh, make it a a fantasy and then some to, to even spend much time thinking about it. But yeah, it's me, interesting they talked about it. But there are there are people who do support that. I I, I agree with you though. It's not going to happen. And the provision back in uh, you know the early days in the Constitution was for the proposition that in order to permit any nuclear energy, you had to have a some super vote. I think it was three quarters vote of the state legislature. It was you know hard to get that. So that it's not and, and the culture point has not changed at all. Nobody's going to buy into that. And uh, actually, there's no good reason to buy into it now. But uh, you know, I, I always wonder uh, you know about these uh, neighbor island conferences on energy when. All the players get on a plane and fly in from somewhere else, mostly Oahu, and you wonder what's really going on. <clears throat> Sounds like a venue of convenience, or maybe not convenience. But um, I think it'll go on, although uh, Jeannie Skog, who is a, a real big force in uh, MEDB, um, was uh, retired this year. You, I don't know if you knew her. And, uh, yeah, that, I, that did. May change, I did. That may change things in the way these conferences are thrown together in Maui. But you have the, the high brass going there, and that's a good sign. And uh, everybody wants to, you know, bend the ear of everyone else. And, and so uh, I query uh, how much of the legislature showed up, because, you know, like it or not, the legislature is in the catbird on anything that happens. And um, it's not clear exactly what's happening. I mean, for example, I don't, <clears throat> I don't see any energy initiatives coming off the fifth floor in the Capitol. <coughs> building, and I don't, I don't know of any remarkable energy developments that are likely to come out of this session. Do you? Uh, I'd say kind of the only thing I'm tracking in terms of energy right now is uh, the fate of, of a couple bills that would provide some type of state support for energy storage. And there's, uh, as of last week, I believe, was a bill, a House bill that was heard by the uh, Senate Joint Senate Committee. It was the Consumer Protection and uh, Energy and Transportation Committee. And then there was a Senate bill that was heard on the corresponding House Committee. So I, I don't know whether both of those committees pass those bills out of committee, something I need to, to look into. So we're about, uh, gosh, a little more than a month away, five or six weeks away from the end of the session. So things will be uh, drawing to a close and also kind of related to energy issues. I don't believe that uh, Governor Ige has submitted the name of Tom Gorak to the, the Senate uh, 
Commerce, uh, Ross Baker's committee uh, in the Senate for confirmation. So he's kind of running out of time to do that. And to take a step back, Tom Gorak was appointed by Governor Ige back in uh, late June last year to take Mike Champley's place as an interim appointment because, of course, in June is when the session is, is out. So an interim appointment, if I, if I got my Hawaii law down correctly, is only good until the end of the subsequent session. So it's going to soon put up or shut up time for Governor Ige to nominate Tom Gorak or surprise the heck out of everybody, perhaps, and find somebody else. But uh, it's, uh, you know, time, time is drawing to a close to, to wrap that up. Well, that is, and you heard it here on Think Tech, you know, it was something we hadn't been thinking about. I, I thought that issue had passed us already, and it was a fait accompli, but no, how interesting. There must be all kinds of thick political undercurrents on that one. You know that Randy Iwasi, the chair, wanted to have that confirmed right, right away. And uh, he, he was, he's been in favor of Tom Gorak, been advocating for him. So this is really, mm, it's a very discomforting surprise to find out that the name has not yet been submitted. And does, I agree with you, that does leave the possibility that uh, David Ige is under pressure to let it go and try appoint someone else uh, who perhaps, uh, you know, uh, would, would be less political resistance. Wow. Well, we have to follow that, Marco. We have to follow that. Well, and, and to what extent there may be some, some below the surface unhappiness with the way the governor handled Mike Champley, uh, replacing Mike Champley uh, when he did with Tom Gorak, uh, to what extent there's some um, political uh, unhappiness in the Senate. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty small body there, obviously 25 people who, who make decisions on such things, but I think uh, there was uh, a, a certain degree of unhappiness on the part of a number of, of senators <clears throat> and, and others uh, as to Champley's uh, replacement and you know, remember the timing. It was at the end of June when the governor announced that Gorak would be taking Mike's place with Mike's term coming to an end. And then all of about 15, 16 days later is when the commission by a two to, two to zero vote with Tom Gorak abstaining two to nothing vote to dismiss without prejudice the application of the acquisition of HCI by Nextera. So there was certain... Uh, certain unhappiness among, in a number of quarters that uh, couldn't the governor have just waited a bit longer and allowed Mike to, to take part in that final decision that he had been an integral part of the process, of course, like uh, Randy Iwase and Lorena Kiva were from the very beginning. So, again, circle back to, to the politics and to, to what extent there's, there's going to be uh, any pushback in the Senate to whoever the governor nominates, and let's assume that it will continue to be Tom Gorak, who, who I, I happen to like. I think he's incredibly capable. But it's uh, you know, just an example of politics uh, potentially uh, inserting itself into uh, to the process. Yeah, and don't forget that, uh, that the, the strange machinations that went on around that vote. It wasn't clear that Lorena Kiba was going to vote against Nextera. It was clear that Randy Iwasi was going to vote against Nextera. And I think it was also clear that, um, that um, Mike Champley was going to vote for next era. So it wasn't settled. And somehow all of that, all of that um, machination there at the end, on um, Mike, the end of Mike's term and his, um, and his summary replacement that way, had a, in my view, it had a profound effect on that vote. And the vote might have gone the other way had that handled been, uh, handled, been handled another way. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, the word next era seems like ancient history at this point. And we haven't heard boo about the possibility of another suitor. And that, that's not a surprise. Uh, after what happens next era, I doubt any other significant suitor would come on the field right now. So that leaves us with well, uh, what? I'm sorry? I would actually beg to differ a little bit when you talk about possible suitor because this um, startup group called 21st Century Utilities has been quite public over the past year or so when it comes to their express interest, which was reiterated by one of their peeps on the ground here, here Cheryl Roberto, Cheryl Roberto, who spoke at the uh, the MAC yesterday, uh, last week, the Maui Energy Conference, where she said, uh, uh, paraphrasing her, that Hawaii would be a great place to try out their new model. 
their mm. new utility ownership model, which in fact they have yet to find uh, number 001 in terms of the utility to purchase to be able to execute mm. this new model. So th there continues to be sniffing around, but in terms of a, a bona fide offer from any new suitor, uh, 21st century has admitted that they have yet to, uh, or they, they have not, submitted an offer to, to Hawaiian Electric Industries for purchase, but that hasn't stopped them from talking to energy stakeholders uh, east, west, north, and south here in Hawaii and uh, getting some, some press coverage for it. Yeah, well, that, you know, uh, I certainly agree that, that that is a logical possibility. Um, on the other hand, so many people come to Hawaii with great ideas and, and can't or don't or won't follow through on them. So who is 21st century? Are they really a suitor? Do they have the kind of pockets that Nestera had? Um, are they, you know, a, a viable candidate? Is their program going to be of interest to anyone? And can they meet the bar? The bar, when I say that, I mean, can they satisfy the powers that be on all sides of the, of the spectrum that they are a qualified and likable candidate? It's a long, it's, that's a hard road to hoe, I must say. Well, I mean, Chairman Randy Owase was quoted last week at, when he attended the, the energy conference as uh, saying that he had no regrets about the decision that they made uh, the previous summer in terms of uh, deciding uh, this without prejudice to, to send uh, Nick Sierra away. But, I mean, there's no doubt. And he also said something interesting as well, I mean, which is just kind of re reiterating what we all knew or know uh, otherwise, which is, you know, Next era came in with a substantial gravitas, to say the least, right? I mean, they're a major player on the mainland, uh, a number of accolades in terms of how they've run their companies over the years, and certainly deep pockets, right? So they come along with an incredibly, I think, generous offer of $4.3 billion, which one could argue was a substantial, uh, uh, substantially above market value for that company. Yep. And that, that, of course, caught the eye of the HEI board, and they decided to, to move forward in this. And it, there's no doubt, I think, in anybody's mind that next year was, in fact, fit, willing, and able. Fit, willing, and able to, to pull this off. But what happened in this decision, explicitly, perhaps for the first time, because, I mean, how often do we get merger proposals like this coming across our, our little state here? Never, I mean, it, never. It happens few and far between, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the new bar that this commission has said is in terms of subsequent uh, offers to, to peel away a major Hawaii corporation is, is it in the public benefit? Is it in the net public benefit and public interest? And then when you start throwing fr phrases like that around, then you, you're, I think, dealing in perhaps a lot more subjectivity and a lot more judgment in terms of what actually constitutes the, the what's best for the public and, and Randy Owase alluded to that explicitly. Yeah. So that's what happened. I, think I, mean, we, I guess the decision ultimately turned into: uh, Do we like these guys? Are they? Is their plan going to meet our plan? And um, are they going to be uh, happy? Are they going to make everyone happy? And the answer is: Well, no. There's a lot of people complaining about it, so therefore it's politically radioactive. We can't do this. And then, of course, Governor Ige's uh, repeated contention that they should not be approved uh, did not have a small effect on it. It had a big effect on it. And that was regrettable because it actually wasn't his business to make uh, that statement. In any event... Uh, well, I mean, what's the likelihood, do you think, Jay, of a, an equal or superior offer coming to the HEI board in the near term. I mean, I, of course, you and I, I, I don't think, are privy to what's going on inside that, uh, I'm sure, richly appointed boardroom. But the likelihood of somebody coming up with an equal, let alone better, offer in terms of uh, you know, four point something billion dollars, I think, is kind of a stretch. Well, it'll never right happen. Now. Never yeah. happen. Not only because of the money, you know, and the, and the you know, business, the four corners of the deal, but because of what happens in next era. You know, I don't think they were treated very well. They were sort of kicked out of town. And, uh, that, you know, how do you avoid that? Uh, it's a hard one. So I don't think there are a lot of next eras around, um, and I don't think it's going to happen. And, and that, that leaves the question, of course, this 21st century question that you alluded to a minute ago, 
is what is their business model? It's not tried yet. How does it mix in with the other possible business models? And when we get back from this break, Marco, I'd like to talk about the emerging new business models for utilities, because that must have been discussed in Maui. It was discussed in Maui before, and uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about what are, the, what are the potentials right now? We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We highlight businesses and individuals that are successful in Hawaii, and we learn their secrets to their success. I hope you can join us and listen in, because we always have a pack of information on successful stories in Hawaii. Aloha. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward, and the show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, and this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon, and let's move Hawaii forward. Okay, Marco. So what, what are the uh, you know, emerging options these days, uh, given 21st century, given Kauai and the KIUC, given HIEC these days? What, what, is, what does it look like? Um, you know, what, what are the most viable alternative options, and how well are they doing? Well, I mean, you're kind of uh, asking me the, a very good question, Jay, which is exactly what the state of Hawaii decided last year to appropriate more than a million bucks to, to address that question. I'm referring to a, a bill and a law that was uh, signed by EGA last session last year that appropriated, if I'm not mistaken, $1.4 million to pay an independent consultant to address those specific questions. So they, in fact, uh, chose a company. This is back in January. The state chose a company called London Economics, which is based on the East Coast. And they had the winning bid, of, of, uh, if I remember correctly, of $970,000. The bid had to be a million or less. And then the rest of that $1.4 million will be gobbled up by, by admin costs on the part of DBED itself. So I spoke to one of the DBED folks who is listed as kind of the point for this particular study. And I said, so when, when can we expect to see... This, this report that more and more people are talking about that was mentioned at the conference as well. And he said, well, our goal is sometime latter part of 2018, but at least in time for the opening of the 2019 session. So the takeaway for me being is that we're going to have to hurry up and wait, 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 wait to get this, uh, this report that London Economics will be presenting to the state and will, of course, be part of the public record. So uh, it's not a very satisfying answer to, to your question. And here you and I are not being paid $970,000 to address that question, but uh, uh, it'll be really interesting to see what, uh, what London Economics comes up with for that, that type of pretty penny. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'd li like to express something which may, you may be thinking. And that is, geez, that's an awful lot of money for DBED to spend. I thought we were strained and stretched. We have a problem paying for the rail and so many other things, so many unfunded obligations in this state. We have, you know, like $40 billion worth of un unfunded. Well, we can throw away a million dollars for another study. And I really don't like the idea that they're going to be finishing just before the session. So somebody pops a bill in the legislature and tries to execute on their plan before it has time to breathe or be socialized. And I, and I think, you know, what we need is a, it's a homegrown plan, if we could just belly up to that. I mean, DBED goes and spends an enormous amount of money on these conferences. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Verge conference coming up, that's really expensive. And they got all these studies going on that never result in anything. Uh, why can't we, uh, you know, put a little money into, for example, uh, credits for storage? Uh, why, why do we spend millions on these studies that go on the, the back shelf? And this one will also go on the back shelf. If we want to figure it out, we should figure it out locally. And, you know, if they gave us $970,000 in a, in a room for a week, you know, Marco, you and me, we could figure it out. How much of that 970 would you like? 
Oh, you know, I think I'd probably settle for 30 or 40 percent because last thing I ever wanted to come across is some type of greedy solar dude. I'm probably already already accused of that enough as it is, Jay. So I'm more than happy to to uh, allocate the, the the majority percentage to you with with gratitude. Thank you very much. I, you know, really, I, and then of course every time you have a study like this, you have a two year throw on it, so nothing ever happens. So we're a long way from making the kind of speed we need to make if we're going to reach any of these goals. And I'm very sorry to see that. I, I see it in the legislature, I see it at the governor's office, and I certainly see it at DBED. Uh, that's where the state energy office is, you remember. But going Well, you know, Jay, beyond, beyond the utility ownership models, which of course are, are very near and dear to my heart, <laughs> and with my involvement with the, the Hawaii Island Energy Co-op, I mean, to me, the more kind of primordial, like the essential question is, what is it exactly do we want our electric utilities to do out here? And you would think that perhaps uh, on, the, on the surface, that's kind of an easy question to answer. Well, we want lower rates. Yes, who's going to disagree with that? We want more cost-effective renewables and more energy independence, of course. Uh, well, who wants to, who's going to disagree with that? But how do you get there from where we are? And I think you get a bunch of smart dedicated energy stakeholders in the room, 10 or 20 of them, and you address that question of what is it that we want to, to have our utilities do, not in 2040 or 2045, because that's you know, practically a lifetime away for some of us, but what can, can and should we do in the near term, the next three, five to 10 years? And my position is that it's not, I don't think it's going to be as easy as you might think to get a clear consensus on the roadmap ahead beyond the kind of vague generalities of 100% renewable in, in decades from now. I think that's a more, much more juicy, philosophical, profound question that, uh, that we need to be addressing more, more effort into. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, all, all the steps that preceded the PSIP were, oh, lurching from one side of the boat to the other. They had too many stakeholders, 80 people were involved. Everybody had to have a voice. It was the same thing like Nextera. There were so many people involved, everybody speaking, and there was really no way to come to a clear decision on it. And even in the case of PSIP, after waiting for years and bouncing it hither and yon, now the, now the, the PUC is not taking action, and when will we hear from them? And that's the only main plan, you know, in the, in, in, in the channel right now. So um, I, we don't have a system for deciding these questions. We don't have a, an energy authority, which in retrospect, that was Neil Abercrombie's idea when he first took office. Uh, we don't have that. We, we, we have so many captains um, commanding this ship that there's nobody commanding this ship. And I don't know what's going to happen, but I am not optimistic about reaching a plan or executing a plan. But let's talk about another factor that has driven right up the middle here. And that is uh, the Trump, the Trump, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the Trump, Trump times, the Trump chapter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're now living in, living in the time of der Trumpenreich. Der Trumpenreich. The Trumpenreich, yes. So, uh, you know, fact is that he, he's taking actions that are usually inconsistent with other actions. I mean, just one small example where... He's, um, you know, uh, he's giving $54 billion to the military, but he's cutting the Coast Guard. I don't understand that. Um, and he's, you know, he's, now he's going to punish us all with a, a tax increase bill that is going to reduce the tax by, uh, by, by a substantial percent for the top earners and, um, and reduce it a lot less for the middle earners. And the result will be that we wind up paying more tax and uh, giving it to the military and all the... Uh, the regulations that have protected us, um, all of the Obama uh, clean energy initiatives uh, that were intended to move things ahead on clean energy um, are, are being abandoned, as, essentially. And that's got to have an effect on Hawaii's initiative, doesn't it? Well, it, absolutely, Jane. Before I get to that subject, it kind of just brings to mind, you know, with this, uh, with this proposed budget of spending a lot more on military and national security, there was a book that got a fair amount of play. Uh, gosh, I believe it was early 1990s by uh, an author by the name of Paul Kennedy. Paul Kennedy, The Rise and Fall of Great Nations. And he looked back historically to from uh, Rome, Roman times, to the British Empire. And uh, from that book came a, a phrase known as imperial overstretch, which essentially, uh, to, to put it in a very kind of simplistic form, 
you have a state that is spending more and more and more uh, to try to project power or project interests far and wide, and it essentially leads to from a, a to a collapse uh, from outside in or, or and or inside out. And yeah, I can't help but be struck. You know, granted that there's no way the the Trump budget is going to pass anywhere close to its current for, uh, proposed form, which is only somewhere on 50 pages or so. It was a it wasn't a budget proposed as much; it was an overview of a budget he would like to see passed. I mean, and that's the legis that's what the Congress does. I mean, they, they decide ultimately where money is going to be spent and how much and so forth. But the the notion that we're spending uh, substantially more on uh, on military national security while infrastructure crumbles, while those neediest among us are the ones, including a lot of Trump voters, are going to be the ones who are really suffering. I just can't help but be, be struck by that now in terms of how Trump's policies as far as energy goes uh, are going to affect Hawaii. I think, at least in the near term, it's going to be a fairly nominal effect uh, because we're, we're kind of uh, you know, obviously in the middle of the Pacific, and we're the captains of our own boat, and we may have too many captains, as you pointed out a few moments ago, certainly at times, but I think we're, we're more immune to some extent to the, uh, the craziness that takes place in Washington because, uh, because of where we are and uh, how far along we are already in terms of developing uh, renewable uh, fuels, renewable energy to make us uh, less dependent on, uh, on imported fuels and less dependent, hopefully, on on the craziness that goes on in our nation's capital. Yeah, but let me offer this thought. You know, it's, it's uh, that he's not going to spend money on, on Pearl Harbor. I think you're going to see Pearl Harbor diminish. Uh, he's not going to spend money on military activities here. He doesn't like Hawaii. Hawaii has been against him. He's a very punitive um, kind of guy. And, and I think uh, we're going we're gonna to feel it uh, more and more all the time. It's going to reach out and touch us somehow. And w the other thing, the last thought I'd like to offer you on this is this. Uh, where if Obama or some reasonable president were in office, he would be thinking of new ways to incentivize, um, you know, renewables, new ways to uh, empower the grid, new ways to enhance the uh, uh, renewable energy and transportation. Um, we're not going to see any of that. We might have seen it, and it's hard to say what the opportunities might have been, but they will not take place under this administration. Instead, we're going to have the Michigas, and that means craziness, in Washington. Your point for closing remarks, Marco. Go for it. Oh, gosh. We live in uh, interesting times kind of across the board, Jay, and I'm still very much a fan of, of California, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii, all voted very blue in the past elections, uh, that we would break off and become the People's Republic of Cow, C-O-W-H, and uh, we would be a place of tolerance, diversity, renewable energy, environmental uh, thinking, ecology, and all that stuff, and we'd be uh, immediately one of the largest economies in the face of the earth. So uh, with that little fantasy, uh, I take my heart off to the, to the New People's Republic. If and when it ever starts, you and I can be ambassadors of goodwill. Yeah, sovereignty looks better and better. Well, thank you, Marco. Great to talk with you. Two weeks hence again, yes? Yes. Okay. Do you do. <laughs> take care. Aloha. Talk Thank soon. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.